Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you once again, uh, Sister Teresa and the organizing committee for inviting me uh, for this conference. And uh, the choice of language was actually in the hands of the organizing committee, so this is why my talk will be in English. Uh, but I'm not an English uh, native speaker. In any case, since I'm working in the United Kingdom and I'm writing in English, it will be in this particular form. Uh, my talk is related mostly to a very um, important, I think, problem in the contemporary culture related to the dialogue between science and theology or faith and reason. And if you deal with this subject, Inevitably, you invoke different sources, uh, and in particular, Russian religious philosophy becomes one of these sources, which gives us some illustrations and ideas about how to relate science uh, and faith. But I will be concentrating today on a very specific, very specific, very particular topic related only to the uh, lectures to Gonman Hood or lectures on theoanthropy, as people translate in English, lecture o Boga uh, by Solovyov, and I would like to discuss only one particular topic, which for me, as a person who lives in the 21st century, who doesn't believe in the relevance of metaphysical concepts anymore, uh, considers uh, many Russian philosophers, and, and including Solovyov, uh, as I would say metaphysicians out of date, because metaphysical concepts of these philosophers, they are not tenable, strictly speaking, and that's why my approach will be based on a completely different approach, either phenomenological or hermeneutic, hermeneutical approach. In other words, I'm more inclined to treat, um, for example, Selby's ideas in terms of providing a hermeneutics for the ambiguous position of human being in uh, the world, and this ambiguous position which is exactly detected and discussed in the dialogue between theology and science. So, in other words, I'm using his ideas as a sort of particular hermeneutic of this uh, uh, dialogue, but the major problem of this dialogue, as I will outline in a second, is unknowability of human being and nobility of men. I uh, apologize for not being politically correct, because I, I'm half of my mind still in Russia, and that's why I consider men with a capital M as a generalized, generic notion for humanity. So that's why um, I hope you will forgive me this. Uh, before I start, I would like to make a very short, uh, yeah, this is in Russian, um, and uh, I would like to say that I want to dedicate this talk to uh, a former friend of mine, who unfortunately is not with us anymore. Uh, Oliver Smith, he was a lecturer at the School of Russian Studies in the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. Uh, and he wrote a book. He was a very great uh, knower of Russian language. He is a student of another Russian scholar, Jonathan Sutton, from the University of Leeds. And he published um, approximately, uh, I think, five, six, seven years ago, I don't remember, the book on Solovyov. Uh, this is quite an interesting book because uh, for me, I, I use all translations of Solovyov by Oliver Smith. Unfortunately, in 2013, he decided to go on a solo trip to the Isle of Skye in Scotland, and he disappeared. His body was found two months later, and um, uh, I still keep very, very warm memories about him. In 2012, he organized in St. Andrews a conference on Russian Orthodox theology, where I was present. So, in other words, it's a little dedication to this noble man, very interesting uh, human being, uh, who wrote a book on Solovyov, and if you if you don't know this book, I would strongly recommend just to take into account. So I will start my talk not from Solovyov as such, but since uh, we have different um, scholars in this room and in this conference from different backgrounds, I need to introduce in a precise, very concise form what is this dialogue about. Now, everybody understands 
the dialogue between science and faith and science and theology in general. But if you study this dialogue, and I did this for many, many, many years, you realize that the major fundamental problem in this dialogue is that uh, no one can actually give a clear account uh, on a philosophical um, a contingent facticity of this dialogue, because the dialogue exists, but I mean, from a philosophical point of view, why this dialogue exists, where it comes from. And my study, which is published in different books, was actually making a diagnosis for this dialogue. And the diagnosis was that, in fact, this dialogue exists because there's an intrinsic split in intentionalities of human being in, in the same mind, between intentionality which is directed to the world and the second modus of, of this intentionality which is directed towards the foundations of this world and the foundations of uh, human existence and in particular human consciousness. And these intentionalities, I mean, they are present in the same human being. So that's why, in fact, my diagnosis was very simple that the, the dialogue between science and theology, it's a, I, internal, it's inherent problem in the split of intentionalities in one and the same human being. So that's why the dialogue between science and theology, first of all, it's an anthropological problem, it's a problem of facticity of consciousness. And then, uh, in view of this, what I am trying to explicate here, I will give you briefly some philosophical precedent for actually this, the essence of this dialogue, uh, and I will conclude that since the human being is the center of this uh, dialogue, uh, I need to deal with this fundamental problem. And Solovyov will come on board exactly at this point, because I use one particular piece of uh, lectures on theanthropy in order to give hermeneutics of this dialogue. But once again, uh, remember that I don't consider uh, seriously Solovyov as a metaphysician because I think his metaphysics is untenable anymore. So, uh, philosophical precede. The dialogue between science and theology represents a discourse of clarification and explication of the difference in the ways of appearance and access of the givens in science and theology in one and the same human subject. Now, this is sort of definition which I make in a uh, strong phenomenological language because all other, uh, I would say, dimensions of this dialogue, I mean, they are, strictly speaking, irrelevant. The difference between science and theology can be qualified as a different philosophical appropriation of that which can be presented in phenomenality of objects, something external to us, and in the phenomenality of events, event like phenomena whose phenomenality exceeds the boundaries of metaphysical definitions, grounded in substantiality, in substance, causality, forcibility, in the position of the possible and impossible. So, in other words, I am employing heavily the phenomenological concept of event, which saturates human intuition to such an extent that no a priori, in a Kantian sense, no a priori forms of sensibility and understanding are possible in order to actually grasp these events in terms of something which is outside them in terms of kind of substance or some transcendental references which pre-exist this event. Events, it's a fundamental point because when in the dialogue between science and theology we uh, interrogate the human condition as such, we are dealing with event. Why? Because no science, no philosophy is capable of giving any substantial or foundational account for the human condition, for the existence of human consciousness. Correspondingly, metaphysical schemes are not applicable for the demarcation of theology and science. In this sense, it's clear immediately if I take this position, I will not be able to employ Solovyov on the metaphysical grounds, because metaphysics doesn't work. Again, I take a stance of contemporary French phenomenology, for example, the depth of metaphysics, according to Jean-Luc Marion, uh, uh, which means that any reference to a particular pre-existent, substantial or ideal sense of the universe and human existence doesn't work because this sense doesn't exist from a point of view of this philosophy. Uh, 
what kind of event we are dealing with. In a theological sense, we are dealing with events such as incarnation, resurrection, ascension, creation of men, the descent of the Holy Spirit, the existence of the Church as the body of Christ. In other words, we are dealing with something which fundamentally exceeds any definitions in terms of the worldly reality, the reality of being. Because these events, like incarnation, resurrection, ascension, they are not foreseeable, they are metaphysically impossible, they are beyond quality and quantity, they are beyond relation. Correspondingly, on all Kantian analysis of these events based on the classification either of forms of sensibility or categories of under, the understanding fails. So no separation of the cognitive faculties on the philosophical and theological modes can be applied to men. Because if we start dealing with the question of human existence, we immediately encounter a fundamental problem that no metaphysical definition of man is possible. And this is a trivial fact from the history of philosophy. So, in other words, if we try to produce any definition of humanity, any definition of man, then we immediately fail the essence of humanity. Because the essence of humanity is exactly this unknowability. And this unknowability, if I uh, just jump a little bit uh, uh, forward, this unknowability is well known, is well known from the history of philosophy and history of Christian thought. I give you only one quote from the Gregory of Nyssa, it's the 4th century AD, and I will not be reading this text, you can do it yourself, but the main idea is the following. If we believe that human being is made in the image of God, and if God is unknowable, incomprehensible, beyond categories of understanding, beyond quality, quantity, possibility, impossibility, and other things, then it's clear that the image, in order to be a genuine image, must be the same. This means that if we sincerely believe that human being is made in the image of God, this image is unknowable in the same, to the same extent as uh, uh, God himself. Correspondingly, the problem of unknowability of human being, of human being, is a fundamental problem which we are dealing with when we try to approach this problem either philosophically or theologically. Neither philosophy nor theology can actually advance this unknowability and to disclose this unknowability. Why? Because by the fact of creation, by the fact of being created, and this is exactly the fundamental formula, a being a creature in the image of God, we are endowed, on the one hand, by the capacity to know the presence, about the presence of God and being in his image. At the same time, we are completely unknowable to ourselves because we are not gods, we are creatures. And this is a fundamental feature which, according to the Greek fathers, cannot be overcome. So, in other words, whatever we can say about God, Ben Hood, and Solov, you off a little bit later, this is a fundamental transcendent gulf between creation and create. And any attempt to actually uh, overcome this gulf on the grounds of either metaphysics or any religious philosophy, positive religious philosophy, is a failure. A failure because it destroys immediately the sense of the human. So, correspondingly, if we accept this, I claim now the following, that the problem of this dialogue between science and theology is the problem of unknowability of human being. Because what science and theology attempt to explain in different languages is exactly this problem. Because science can't explicate this problem on the grounds of uh, the positive experience when it represents the world in the phenomenality of objects. Positive theology can give only interpretation of the human condition. And correspondingly, this interpretation, whether it's historical, 
based on literature, based on the gospel message, gives you only one thing. It's the open-ended hermeneutics of the human condition. But no ontology, no metaphysics is present behind this. Because metaphysically speaking, the concept of man as defined in the categories of the transcendental subjectivity or in terms of substance is untenable. It's existentially futile. It doesn't have any sense. In order to make it more clear, I give you just very quickly how to express this unknowability in standard terms. The best way, from my point of view, is just to refer to the paradox of subjectivity, which was named, it was coined by Husserl in his last work, The Crisis of the European Sciences, and which is a very simple paradox. On the one hand, we are in the world because we have the body, we are embodied. On the other hand, as articulating consciousness as a center of disclosure and manifestation of the world, its articulation, we are in the center of the universe. And this paradox is not explained or not uh, presented by any positive, either scientific, philosophical, or theological means, because, strictly speaking, of unknowability of men, because this paradox encodes. Here, I'm sorry, I know that you are all from the human sciences. It's just a simple, simple diagram which tells you that on the one hand human being is in the chain of being in this Ouroboros model where we have the whole universe. On the other hand, human being is outside of this chain of being because the whole, uh, the wholeness of the universe, this Ouroboros, is articulated by human beings. So that's why it's a very simple thing. Now, I will skip all quotations on the paradox because if you uh, go through the literature, through the philosophy of the 20th century, I say that practically every phenomenological philosopher he was quoting and uh, invoking this paradox. So I just will skip it. Just to say that French philosophy, German philosophy, Russian philosophy, here, it's a quotation from the 7th century of St. Maximus the Confessor who was invoked yesterday. He knew about this paradox. Uh, Vladimir Solovyov, because we are dealing with Solov. So, Man comprise in himself all possible positions, all of which are reduced to one greater position between the unconditional and conditional, between the absolute and eternal being and the transient phenomenon and illusion. Man is a deity and nothing at the same time. Very simple. But I express this slightly different. I say that man is a creature and man is not God. So in this sense, indeed, as a creature, he is nothing, but as articulating creature, which articulates in single consciousness the whole world, definitely he is a god. And now we come to the final part. A nobility of men is an incarnational archetype. What is this about? The question is the following. But if man is a noble, how can we deal with this dialogue? What is the sense of this dialogue? And when Solovyov is saying about god manhood when he creates the whole edifice of different metaphysical concepts, then we must ask a simple question, but he does this in the conditions of unknowability of men. He does this in the condition of unknowability of himself. That is why whatever he is saying is done in the conditions of unknowability, what is he talking about? And that's why we need to give interpretation of because without this interpretation, whatever he says becomes a metaphysical concept which has no uh, objective existential meaning. When I think about incarnational archetype, I say the following, that theology, theology gives at least a very modest interpretation of what is meant. Theology never attempts, actually, to disclose the sense of creaturehood, apart from saying that, according to the Book of Genesis, human being was created in the image of God. In this sense, the real, uh, I would say, hermeneutics, which comes from the Christian part of the Bible, from the Gospel, is exactly the Incarnation, which was invoked many times in this conference. But the Incarnation is a very, very serious thing, not only from the point of view of the dogmas of faith, but Incarnation is a very serious thing in terms of its cosmological implications. 
Because if we look carefully what incarnation means, we must understand, according to modern science, that for the incarnation to take place, in other words, for the body of Christ and for the body of Mother of God to exist, we need at least 10 billion years of absolutely empty evolution of the universe. 10 billion years is approximately two-thirds of the age of the universe now. And the universe was absolutely empty because atoms did not exist, no form of life existed. And that's why it was absolutely impossible to have anything like human being and human body. So that's why the incarnation is extremely important principle because it's implanted in the structure of the world, if we believe sincerely according to the creed. Because the incarnation is a pivotal mechanism in actually creating the conditions for existence of humanity in this universe. And instead of the anthropic principle which is invoked in uh, cosmology, I would propose theoanthropic principles saying that we need to have the structure of the universe in order the incarnation would be possible. And the structure of the world means the spatial structure, the scale of temporality, the structure of substance is all the structures are related to the fact of the incarnation. It can be shown. Correspondingly, when we say about the incarnation, you remember it was yesterday the discussion of Igor Yulampi who was saying about actually preparation uh, of the world for this kind of event. I would say that in some sense, if according to the creed the incarnation was planned by God before the creation of the world, then then the incarnation is implanted in the structure of the world. And the world is imbued with the incarnation as its achieved telos. But from here, from here, if we give this interpretation, we have the interpretation of the human condition only on the grounds of the necessary conditions, not sufficient conditions, because indeed the necessary conditions are fulfilled, but the sufficient conditions, they are not subject to physical explanation. Sufficient conditions, they have in, indeed providential and theological sense. So, according to some of you, and here we come to the incarnational archetype, because what I'm trying to say is that in order to interpret the sense of humanity, once again, not to give an account of what humanity is, but to give an interpretation, theological, he writes, Christianity has its own content independent from all the elements of which it consists. And this content is solely and exclusively Christ. In Christianity as such we find Christ and only Christ. He is the truth repeated many times by very poorly understood. Poorly understood is absolutely right. Because in contemporary language in the 21st century we understand if we are in a Christian mind that indeed the whole universe is imbued with the presence of Christ because the body of Christ is implanted in the seeds of the Big Bang, in the sins of creation. But Christ, and this is a fundamental difference from what was said previously, because when I invoked the idea that Christ is predetermined by the structure of the universe, I invoke an argument which is similar uh, to the argument of a Scottish theologian, Tom Torrance, who published in 1967 a very interesting book, Space, Time and Incarnation, where he actually made a clear link between the structure of space-time and the presence of God in this. Now, but where Christ comes from? Because on the one hand, on the necessary conditions, Christ is there. But on the level of sufficient conditions, we don't understand why the incarnation happened 2,000 years ago, but not before. In the same way as we don't understand why the world was created, let's say, according to the Bible, 6,000 years ago, according to cosmology, 13.7 billion years ago, we don't know. Responding to what he writes, the historical appearance of Christ is indissolubly connected to the entire world process. Indeed, I commented on this. And with the denial of its appearance, the meaning and the directionality of the universe are lost. Once again, if we remove Christ, there is no intrinsic teleology, there is no intrinsic sense in the world. The world is contingent. Cosmology says that the world is contingent, contingent and effectively as I tried to ask a question of Geoff Patterson in the uh, lecture yesterday, it's a kingdom of death, effectively, because we can't live anywhere in cosmos. The whole nature 
aspired and gravitated towards a human. The whole of human history was directed towards a God-man. Again, he reproduces the same idea. That indeed, there is a sort of teleology, there is a sort of directionality in the evolution of the world which leads to uh, God-man. But, but, what is the difference in my position with Solovyov? This directionality is implanted in the world only on the level of the necessary conditions, but not sufficient conditions. And the sufficient conditions, they are not in the world. The sufficient conditions from indeed come indeed from the God, and they come from the Incarnation, but the Incarnation itself being in, implanted in the universe because of the physical conditions, itself is a contingent event. Event! Exactly what I meant by event in my positioning, the difference between science and theology, because this event cannot be controlled by science. This event is controlled by the completely different forces, by the providential or whatever we can say about divine, transcendent, uh, transcendent influence on this world. I would say upon this world as a descent of something, descent of God, descent of the Holy Spirit. Its personal incarnation in an individual human is only the last link in a long series of incarnations. It's problem, the same problem which I said before. But then the final point, the final point, what is in this case God? And my interpretation, uh, it's a sort of analogy with the contemporary interpretation of God. In the French philosopher Michel Henry, saying that in some sense, it's extremely difficult to make a distinction if we take a phenomenological stance, but not metaphysical, between our perception of God and our perception of life. So that's why whatever Solovyov is trying to say between the lines, but he's not saying, because he's not a phenomenologist yet, he's saying that, in fact, to make a difference between life and God is extremely difficult. But we need to do this, uh, we need to do this, uh, we need to um, articulate this difference. Why? Because God in human experience is not something which is implanted in the structure of the world. According to the uh, strong uh, Eastern Orthodox position, in order to achieve God, in order to be deified, we need grace. And grace, a condensation of the Holy Spirit upon history, comes through the liturgical action. Yes. Right, okay. So, finally, uh, if we look what is here right, and again, I don't say that this is a uh, fulfilled, uh, accomplished program according to Solovyo. It's an attempt to claim that theanthropy, Boga Chilovechistva, exceeds theology. In what sense? That Christianity is not the theory of the Logos. It's not the theory of the second person of the Holy Trinity. Christianity is about event, event of the incarnation of Christ, which is not controlled by the metaphysical factors. So, and the very final slide. The God-man or existent reason not only understands the meaning of all in the abstract, but realizes this in reality. This was invoked yesterday. Everybody talks about this idea of God-manhood, that we need to realize the unity of the world to produce the instantaneous synthesis of the world, not in knowledge, but in reality. But what is this, strictly speaking? From a philosophical point of view, of course, it's a sheer abstraction. And that's why it's metaphysically, again, untenable. Because nobody understands what it is, because we are living in such a universe, in such a disjoint, causally disconnected world, which is full of actually very strong, deadly, I would say, inhuman, uh, not consubstantial uh, elements of the universe, which we don't know even how to unify them in theory. And that's why, of course, the only way I can interpret this is what Solovyov is trying to say is to collect all representations of the world separate, disjoint, extended, 
in one single consciousness, but this is not consciousness of a human being at the time. It's the consciousness of the second person of the Trinity, of Christ as the second person of the Trinity. So that's why the ultimate task is to go to this type of consciousness of the Logos himself, but whatever he is saying about theocracy, about ascent in the free willing of uh, people towards this goal, I put a big doubt on this, because this is a monastic, ascetic ideal, which is probably not achievable in the foreseeable future by all humanity. Still, I believe, yes. Yes. Uh, Finally, final phrase, final phrase. Now, if we come to the uh, dialogue between science and theology, what I say is that the dialogue between science and theology, and Solovyov only confirmed this task, it's an open-ended hermeneutics of the human condition with no accomplished goal. It's a teleology, it's a wishful thinking where the end reconciliation of faith and science is a sort of telos, but or purpose with no ontological reference. That's it. Thank you very much.